You're listening to the Dear Baseball Gods podcast. In this show, I help parents, players, and coaches better navigate their baseball careers. All right, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods. In today's episode, we're going to talk about first, run expectancy, and second, nutrition for middle school ball players. So, Obviously, nutrition is a part of being a good athlete. It's uh, something that can be really tough, I think, for parents to control, and it's tough for younger kids to understand and buy into, so we'll chat a little bit about some of the do's and don'ts for that. So before we get going, obviously, it is the holiday season, so if you're listening here in 2020 and you're looking for a gift for someone in your family who's a baseball nerd, just remember that in the show notes of today's podcast, you'll find my two books. You'll find my online courses, and you'll find also links to my strength and conditioning program called Early Work. So if you're looking for the baseball fan in your family, the athlete in your family, or friend, uh, definitely check out the show notes with lots of my other content that's giftable and is going to keep giving as you go. So first here on the docket today is run expectancy. So if you haven't heard this term, run expectancy is... It's sort of, I wouldn't really call it a sabermetric stat, but it's something in the whole realm of right advanced stats, which aka sabermetrics. But run expectancy basically means this. It's how many runs can be expected on average in a given base out state. So a base out state is first and second. It's two bases and no one out. That's no outs. So the base and out interaction. So bases loaded, two outs is a base out state. Bases loaded, no outs is a different base out state. So there's 24 of them. So that's all the different combinations of zero, one, or two outs. And then all the different combinations of base occupation. So runner on first, runner on second, runner on third, first and second, first and third, second and third, bases loaded. So all those, they make a matrix of basically 24 options. So for every base out state, there's major league data that's shown how many outs have been scored um, given that state. So obviously the highest one would be bases loaded and no one out. So I'm going to rattle off just a couple. And then I have a two pieces of content here. Number one, I have an article about uh, run expectancy and, and, and bunting. So I'll link that in the show notes. And that article shows some of these uh, charts where you can see the different interactions of base out states. It's actually really interesting for any baseball fan. Um, whether you're a coach or player doesn't matter or just a casual baseball fan, it's really interesting to say, oh, wow, they score 0.78 runs on average when it's a runner on second and and two outs or or one out or whatever it is. So, but a couple interesting ones to note. So for bases loaded, which has the highest run expectancy with no outs, is 2.29 runs are scored on average when a pitcher is faced with a bases loaded and no out situation. Bases loaded in two outs drops to 0.75 runs. So obviously you have to get one key hit. And when you get that key hit, you're typically going to play two runs. Um, But most of the time, you know, batting average is what they are. You're not going to get that key hit and you're going to get zero runs. So again, these are all averages and it's pretty interesting. So obviously there are some situations where with bases loaded, no outs, the team will score 11 runs in that inning. Um, But again, that's just for the inning as a whole. With bases loaded and no outs, the max you could score is four runs, and the minimum you could score is zero runs. So again, those averaged out over the entire course of a huge major league season, then multiple seasons of data combined, give all these different averages. So this is interesting, and I'm going to talk about this in a, in a subsequent podcast, but this is interesting because as a coach, you want to have an idea of what are the most valuable base out states. And so this is where it gets really interesting with bunting in that a runner on first and no outs is more valuable. Your, your team has a higher run expectancy with a runner on first and no one out than a runner on second and one out. And so this is where it starts to fly in the face of sack bunting because we know from major league data, at least, so at least bunting in the major leagues, if you were to bunt a runner from first to second and give up an out, you would actually hurt your team's chances of scoring that inning. You you would hurt the expected amount of runs your team would score in that day. Now, this is easily, um, you know, humans are dumb. So it's easy to say, well, I did it this day and we, you know, got the hit and we scored a run and that helped. If, you know, we hadn't got that, we hadn't bunted him second, 
and you know, then he wouldn't have scored on that single. Well, that's all well and good, but you have to look over the long term and say, how many times have we done this where we've scored? And that's what these run expectancy tables do. They're saying, here's a thousand situations where they bunted a runner from first to second, or he just was advanced to second. And then how many times did he score in that situation? Well, again, it's been pretty much proven, at least the major league level, that it it hurts your team's chances of scoring or how many runs you can expect in that situation, bunting a runner from first to second. That's just one example. Um, and so here's the big thing about it. Let me well, let me rattle off a couple others that I have here. So first and second with no outs is 1.44 runs expected. Um, with a uh, if the first batter, so when you have a clean inning, brand new inning, no one on. Uh, no one out. That's 0.48 runs is expected. So that obviously sort of matches the average ERA. So about a half a run per inning is about a 4.5 ERA, which is about an average ERA. That makes sense. If you get the first out, that cuts in half to 0.25 runs in a, a, a again a base out state of one out and no one on. So it's pretty interesting. So if you get that that first batter out for the new inning, you're essentially cutting that team's chances or cutting the expected runs in half because it isn't really probability it's how many runs should be expected in that situation on average so if you're um you got the first runner out or you got the first hitter out in four innings the team would expect to score one run over those four innings right so they would probably still scrape across a run one of the four innings where you got the first runner out or the first batter out so again, that's, it, it's really interesting and it's good just to like get your mind around what you're doing as a coach and why, because a lot of coaches still just bunt because they've always been bunters and you know, they're biased and you know, when they, when it works, they pat themselves on the back that that was a good thing to do. And when it doesn't work, um, they sort of dismiss it. And that's again, sort of like selection bias, confirmation bias. Um, you only pay attention to the results that you want and you don't pay attention to the results that are counter to your position. So again, run expectancy has some issues. So we're going to talk about uh, bunting more specifically in another podcast, but you know, it's not just run expectancy is the only thing. There's also win probability. So even though it might, you might expect to score less runs by bunting a runner from first to second. If you did this in the ninth inning, when it's a tie game, that does increase your chance of winning the game. So if you did this in the second inning, it does not really. So there are some stipulations. So it's not a bunning is the devil situation. Um, there's just, you have to understand some of the stats and then how you can use them and apply them. The other thing is, this is all MLB data. So run expectancy from MLB data is not going to apply super well to 12U baseball or 16U baseball, where outcomes are much less certain. The thing about major league data is, especially when you're starting to apply run expectancy to bunting, which run expectancy, it applies most to where you can control what you're going to do. So you can't use run expectancy that much when you're just saying, hey, Joey Votto, go get a hit. Like Joey Votto is going to try his best to get a hit no matter what. But if you're wondering whether you should bunt Joey Votto, that's where the run expectancy tables start to influence your decision. You know, that's where it matters a lot more. Or if you're trying to hit and run for Joey Votto, that's going to start to influence your decisions a little bit more. That being said, in the major leagues, when someone puts down a sack bunt, the outcome is almost certain, right? You don't put down a sack bunt and then beat it out. That's not a, a thing. You can sometimes put on that, you know, the sneaky bunt for a hit, push a bunt to the right side, drop down a great bunt on the third baseline when they're not, you know, third baseman's on his heels and you beat it out. But that's not a sack bunt. So true sack bunts in the big leagues, you're out, right? Like you're out. And so that's where these tables make sense where we can say, hey, if you sack bunt here, it's going to reduce your run expectancy. Whereas at 13U baseball, if you sack bunt here, they're going to throw that ball into the bleachers one out of every eight times, probably, right? They're going to not pick the ball up. They're going to like, you know, try to grab it out of the grass. The grass is going to be thick or they're just going to pick it up and it's going to stay there. Then they're going to get panicked or they're going to throw the wrong base or they're just like so many things you do at, at young ages when you're just not as highly skilled at baseball. So the outcomes are much less certain to where it probably makes a lot of these a push when you're starting to talk about bunting. But again, we'll talk about that more in another episode. But it's just in, it's just important as a coach to start to understand how outs interact with the game. And this is a big takeaway from the Moneyball uh, book and movie is that giving away an out is the worst thing you can do. And you just essentially outs are the currency of baseball. 
and you never want to sacrifice an out for a base. That's essentially the take home message from um, their work with on base percentage and with run expectancy tables and sort of the combination of the two is that outs are precious and trading them for one base is almost never a good move, except in some situations very late in the game where it's clear how many runs it requires to win the game. So hopefully this expl- this explanation of run expectancy was helpful. And again, check out the show notes below for an article that expands on this written by me just a couple years ago. All right. In section two today, let's talk about nutrition for middle school ball players. So the number one thing to remember is young kids don't know anything about nutrition. So I think at this point in your life, you're a parent or a coach starting to educate them on what food is and what foods comprised of, right? Macronutrients, micronutrients. So macronutrients being fats, um, carbs, you know, all that stuff, uh, protein, micronutrients being all the vitamins and all the things that we still don't know are important and healthy for us. Uh, because we still don't know that much about, um, human nutrition. There's still a lot out there. Like we know that a cluster of broccoli is healthier than just the sum of the vitamins that we can detect within them. Right. We know it's got fiber. We know it's got vitamin C. We know it's got vitamin K and vitamin A and it's got all these different compounds in it that we know we've identified, but even then it wouldn't be better for us to take a pill with that exact cocktail of micronutrients, it still wouldn't be better for us than eating the broccoli itself, that there's a sort of holistic, um, you know, the, the, sum, the sum of the parts is not greater than the whole here. And there's still a lot of compounds chemically that we just don't understand how they interact with human health. And so it's at the very least it's a good assumption to say that still eating whole foods is the healthiest thing we can do. And of course, giving, you know, vitamin supplements are helpful. They're better than nothing, but you know, it's, uh, it's still, there's a lot to know about nutrition. So for young kids starting to learn about it is an important process because they just don't understand what makes a person fatter than, than, you know, than someone else. And you know, what makes one food healthy versus another. And there's a lot of interactions that we don't think about. So one, I'll give you one example. Avocado toast, I think is one of the most overrated healthy foods out there. When you start to look at it from a, how much fat and carbs are in it perspective, it's not that much different than a slice of pizza. Like a pizza has a lot of carbs and a lot of fat from the cheese and avocado toast has a lot of fat from the avocado and a lot of carbs from the bread. So they're actually from a macronutrient um, standpoint, pretty similar from a micronutrient standpoint. There's a lot of like healthy things about avocados, but in that sort of cocktail, it's not necessarily like the healthiest option for maybe like an adult who's trying to keep their weight down, for example, you know, the interaction between all the foods in your meal is really, really important. And young kids can start to learn a little bit about that when they're younger. And again, I don't think I'm not saying avocado toast is not a healthy option, but I just don't think it's, I think it's a little overrated to be honest. So my point here is that young kids don't know much about it. It's hard to trust what they're learning in school. And a lot of the stuff that we used to learn in school was like really outdated and food pyramid and boring and you know, I think one of the best things you probably can do as a, as a parent is just start, ask your kid to cook with you or just like try to be engaged, help them engage with their food and the preparation of it and have them try new things. And, you know, I have a young nephew and it's, you know, he's two, but it's cool seeing him try new foods and lots of outside the box things that like I didn't eat when I was two. Like I didn't, I didn't eat a pomegranate till I was like, I don't know, probably 20, 25. It's not obviously a food many people eat consistently, consistently, at least in the U.S., but, um, you know, here's a two-year-old trying pomegranate seeds, you know, over our, our holiday weekend. So that stuff is is good. It's just building this um, confidence where they can try new foods. And obviously, I'm probably preaching to the choir. I'm sure many of you parents out there have been trying to get your kids to branch out and try new foods for for eons. But I do think that educating your kids is going to help the buy-in because if they're not bought into why is food good for me or why is having a diversity of foods that I eat good for me or why is nutrition important for me as an athlete, then they're just going to eat the tastiest things that they can get their hands on. And I think that's a realistic thing to do. 
Um, at the end of the day, that's the same thing like animals do. They're just going to eat what they can get, and they're going to eat more of the tastier things than the, the not tasty things. And I think when we don't have a good educational base about what we eat and why, then we do the same thing, right? Like if I had two choices, I didn't know anything about the the health benefits of either. If I had a, you know, I had a bowl of plain oatmeal and I had a slice of pizza, I would always eat the pizza. It just tastes better. So why, why would I ever choose the oatmeal? Um, you know, unless I had some reason for it. And I think sometimes we take that for granted. So the big thing is obviously kids are going to fall into two buckets. Usually it's on the one bucket where they need to add weight. Like they're too scrawny. They're not strong enough and they want to gain weight. The other bucket obviously is the kids that are a little overweight and need to lose weight. So the big thing with middle schoolers is it seems like they're not going to make big changes to their body composition like an adult would because a lot of it's just the genetic stuff. Like we've seen lots of kids in my academy where they're just a little chubby. They kind of have baby fat and it's not really anything because it's not really about their activity. It's not so much necessarily all the time about their, their food choices. Of course, sometimes it is, but sometimes that's just like their body for that point in their, in their development. And when they hit their growth spurt, I've seen a lot of chubby kids become skinny kids, which is honestly fascinating and bizarre. Um, but just it's a good thing to remind yourself of that it's not always the way they are today is not the way they are they will always be necessarily when they hit their growth spurt and finish growing it's it's pretty crazy how much baby fat can endure even until the end of high school so but even then like making healthy choices obviously is important and again you have to this i think the comeback comes back to still psychology because kids have to be bought into why they're eating what they're eating or it just has to be completely controlled by you parents so Obviously, you can control what's on their plate. Of course, we've all been in that stalemate, and I was too as a kid, where, no, I'm not eating that. I'll, I'll sit at this table as long as you want me to, and I'm not going to eat that. Um, and that's tough. And so, again, I think having some sort of democratic process and some sort of, like, hey, you can be involved and decide what you want to eat, but let's start to branch out and find other things that you might like that are maybe healthier. And I think that's important. Of course, the big thing here, especially for kids that want to gain weight, is packing and planning ahead because in middle school especially you don't know how to cook right like you might know how to cook a couple things i can't remember when i learned how to like make ramen or mac and cheese but it was maybe like eighth grade early high school i don't know um but obviously if they don't know how to make that much uh many quick meals and quick meals are the hardest thing right the easiest things for on the go which a lot of kids need because they're so busy is fruit which you know won't expire if it's in their backpack all day you know, like bars. And fortunately there's more bars than ever out there on the market. Many are who are, many of which are made of like whole foods a lot more so than when I was in college, which was just like this mush packed into like a little, they're just disgusting. Um, obviously shakes are a lot, I mean, they're getting pricey and I don't personally really take many shakes, but, um, those are helpful. Um, obviously nuts are always great. Cause again, they don't expire beef jerky, and just like simple sandwiches like peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and banana, stuff like that. And of course, again, I'm, I'm probably preaching the choir for most of you parents who have been urging your kids to take healthy stuff like that with them. The one thing I would say is your kids don't need Gatorade. Now, I think it's fine if they're like a treat. I think it's fine if it's like a super hot day. But in general, calorie containing beverages are a big source of um, just unneeded sugar. And Gatorade is not necessary to play sports. It just isn't. So... I think most nutritionists from what I've seen recommend lower sugar sports drinks. So you could take Gatorade and half and just dilute it by half and it's still got plenty of sugar in it and it's got the electrolytes that they'll need. But again, electrolytes are very overrated as well. Unless you're a distance runner or it's super hot, double header catching, unless it's like a really exceptional heat and sweat kind of day, you just don't really need electrolytes to get through your workout. You're going to get tons of electrolytes from the typical American diet. And so I would just urge you to, to rethink, um, cause I'm not going to make any specific food recommendations, but I would urge you to rethink calorie containing beverages and their healthfulness and their necessity because Gatorade wants you to know that Gatorade is, ne is necessary for good performance, but it just isn't, it just isn't. So there's a lower calorie option, Gatorade and Powerade and all the other brands. Coconut water is a healthy option. It's got less sugar than Gatorade does. You can also buy the Gatorade mix, which I grew up on, and you can make it a little more dilute. That's also a good option. Also saves you a good amount of money. So those are all choices um, and options to think about. And obviously, like for the kids who need a little bit of weight loss, 
Those are going to be important things, not guzzling down extra 100 grams of sugar a day. So, you know, with all this stuff, I think the biggest things are packing your kids healthy things that they like to eat, um, prioritizing real food. I still don't think 12 year olds need to be eating a lot of protein shakes. I think that's a little bit lazy and it's not real food. Like it's just a fractionated food. It's, it's, it's the way from, you know, whey protein is healthy enough, but whey protein is a fraction from milk. I'm not saying that they should be drinking whole milk all day either, but Again, I think as a parent, it's harder. And for me as an adult trying to eat healthy in my daily life, it's harder to plan around whole foods. But, you know, I think the effort's worth it because with a lot of these new concoctions, we still don't know the long-term health ramifications either. Is it good for a 12-year-old to be guzzling protein shakes from, you know, age 12 till late into adulthood for 30 years, taking protein shakes for 30 years? There's a lot of little artificial things in it. We're still just pretty new. It's still like a little bit of an infant um, industry, all the health supplements. So again, I know they've been FDA approved, all that sort of stuff, but I think the best thing is to always be pretty skeptical of anything that's not a whole food or if it's like a bar, you know, was this just like a bunch of different whole foods mashed up and, and made into a bar. That's definitely going to be better than some of these ones that are just, again, like fractionated foods that are long, long since resembling anything like a real food. So that's a big thing to consider. And again, I, I wish I had more like definite do's and don'ts, but I think again, it just takes, it takes buy-in because younger kids, they want to eat what they want to eat. Right. So for you, I think the challenge is, is the psychological aspect of getting them to buy in, to understand what healthy food is and what unhealthy food is and why they would want to find new foods that they like, and also to take control of their nutrition as a, as a tool to be a better athlete. That's it for today's episode of Dear Baseball Gods. I'd greatly appreciate it if you'd subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget, in the notes of this show, you'll find links to my pitching manual, Pitching Isn't Complicated, my memoir, Dear Baseball Gods, my online video pitching courses, and my new baseball strength training program called Early Work. You can sign up right now for a free 14-day trial to Early Work, And if you're interested in one of my online courses, you can save 20% on any one of them using the promo code BASEBALLGODS. Thanks again for listening and stay on your hustle. You never know who's watching.